great to have you with us, uh, Jürgen. And, and uh, so this is the start of the, of the second uh, presentation. And uh, as you can see, the title is Behavioral in the Short Run and Rational in the Long Run Evidence from S&P 500 Auctions uh, with two uh, important and well-known co-authors. So um, again, 20 minutes for the presentation. Just go ahead. The floor is yours. So thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, including my uh, my paper uh, in a very nice uh, conference. So as I said, my, my, my paper is joint work with uh, Joost Dries and Ole Wilms, who are both at, uh, at Tilburg University. Um, so in this paper, we're going to estimate uh, the pricing kernel or stochastic discount factor. And this pricing kernel represents the preferences of investors over risky outcomes. And because the pricing kernel is really a central object in many asset pricing models, uh, this exercise has been done before. And actually seminal work on the estimation of the one month pricing kernel shows that if you estimate the pricing kernel as a function of the stock market return, this pricing kernel does not slope downward monotonically, but rather there is an, uh, an interval on which the pricing kernel slopes upward instead of sloping downward. What do we do in our paper? So we estimate this pricing kernel from S&P 500 options, but we won't do this just for one month options. We actually move beyond this and also estimate the pricing kernel from two months, three months options and so on. And this will allow us to look at the term structure of the pricing kernel and moreover, we will also analyze uh, time series variation in, in, in this object. So the research question that we're after is, do preferences over risk vary across horizons? And do these vary over time? And how we'll approach this question is, so we develop a new methodology to analyze the term structure of the pricing kernel. And this is something we will refer to as the forward pricing kernel. And for this term structure of the stochastic discount factor, this is actually something that we're gonna compare to the predictions of many leading uh, asset pricing models. All right, so let me skip the uh, literature overview in the interest of time and jump directly into uh, the methodology on how we're gonna estimate this object. All right, so we estimate the pricing kernel from a portfolio of options with a with which have a maturity of capital T. Uh, and these portfolios we're actually going to use, these are referred to as uh, butterfly spreads. And the payoff of a butterfly spread is represented in the following, uh, following graph. So this is a butterfly spread, which has a, a strike Ki and a spread of delta K. And as you can see from this graph, if the spread is sufficiently narrow, this butterfly spread identifies the pricing kernel on a narrow interval. So how are we gonna use this? So we actually what we're doing is we discretize the payoff space uh, in, in, in our estimation. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say that the payoff of this butterfly spread in state J minus one is gonna be the expected value over the interval from BJ minus one up to BJ. Similarly, in state J, the payoff of a butterfly spread is going to be equal to the expected value over the interval BJ to BJ plus one. Then the price of this butterfly spread will be this payoff in each of these states. In our example, this will be three states, but this can be, uh, this is without the loss of generality. And the price of this price of, of this butterfly spread will be equal to the payoffs in each state multiplied with the uh, pricing kernel in each of the corresponding states. So on a certain trading day, we do not just observe one butterfly spread, but we observe multiple butter butterfly spreads, which translates in the following system of equations. Capital I represents the amount of butterfly spreads we observe, and capital J refers to the amount of states uh, we have if this, these numbers are equal, we know that this payoff matrix will be square. And actually, this system of equations identifies the pricing kernel uniquely. 
So there's only one solution to this uh, system of equation. All right. So as I said, we won't just do this using one month options, but we also can do the exact same thing using two month options and so on. I will now give an example on how we identify or how we uh, define this forward pricing kernel by comparing a one month or one period pricing kernel and a two period pricing kernel. So the difference between this one period pricing kernel and two period pricing kernel, that contains information on how investors today look at risk in the second period. All right, so we start with the general asset pricing equation and we iterate one period forward. What we obtain is a two period pricing kernel seen here. And this is actually what we can estimate. So we can estimate this two period pricing kernel. We can estimate using two period options. At the same time, our methodology also allows us to estimate the one period pricing kernel from one period options. And therefore the difference between these two that contains information, and this is what we will refer to as the forward pricing kernel. As you can see from this equation, is that this forward pricing kernel is a function of the return in the first period and the return in the second period. And therefore, what we will do, we are going to calculate the expectation of this forward pricing kernel with respect to the first period return conditional on the return in the second period. That's how we define our forward pricing kernel. And as said, this contains information on how investors today perceive risk in the second period. Uh, this expression you can generalize uh, to not only look at risk in the second month, but also risk in the third month and so on. In our empirical analysis, we will look at the forward pricing kernel up to maturity of 12, uh, of 12 months. All right, in order to estimate the pricing kernel and then afterward estimate the forward pricing kernel, we have to model the returns on the S&P 500. We're gonna assume that the S&P 500 follows a skewed T distribution, right? A skewed T distribution can capture some stylized effect of index returns, namely that the index returns are left skewed and uh, are fat tailed. Moreover, we're gonna assume that volatility follows a linear, uh, is linear in the VIX, where the VIX has been shown to be able to predict future volatility relatively well. So this model we will use in order to estimate the T period pricing kernel. Now in order to calculate the forward pricing kernel, we have to take the expectation over this T period uh, over this T period return, conditional on the return in the uh, conditional on the return from period T to T plus one. And how we're doing this, we're going to assume that uh, the volatility, so the VIX in our case, will be dependent on the return realization of the first period, which is represented by this. So this VIX. Uh, process will be uh, persistent, which is captured by this lambda, and dependent on the return realization in the first uh, T period. So these two terms capture the fact that volatility will increase when the um, return realization is large in magnitude, or will increase when stock returns are very low. This, and this is also known as the leverage effect. All right, then something on, on, on the data. So we use option prices from the S&P 500 from starting in 96 up to 2017. And in order to estimate the pricing kernel, we will make use of the volatility surface, which we will construct uh, in the same way as option metrics does. The volatility surface, we will have an observation of uh, the volatility on every day, which allows us to estimate the pricing kernel on each trading day that there are options. 
So below I present the estimation results of a return model. So in panel A, I present the result of our uh, skew T model, where the mu is the expected return, alpha and beta are the linear factors of the VIX. So you see that the VIX does a good job in predicting volatility as this beta is somewhat close uh, to one. This psi is the skewness related term. Uh, if the distribution is not skewed, the parameter is one. When it's below uh, one, it means that the return distribution is left skewed. And the V can be interpreted as the degrees of freedom of a, of a T uh, distribution. 10 minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, so then the results in panel B, we need in order to calculate the uh, conditional return, uh, to, to calculate the expectation, uh, the conditional expectation. So this is the average, uh, average VIX, uh, average monthly VIX, and the main parameters or interest are this row one and row two. These indicate that indeed, when the return is very low over the first period, uh, stock market volatility is gonna increase or volatility will increase when the realization is very large in, 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 uh, in magnitude. All right, let me now jump into uh, the results. So first I will start by showing the results with respect to the term structure of the pricing pyramid. And this is what we find. So let's focus on the left graph where, where I present the average pricing kernel over our sample period. So the solid line shows the one month pricing kernel and this pricing kernel is strongly U-shaped. What that means is that investors are willing to pay high prices for put options which pay out when the stock market does very poorly and simultaneously are willing to pay a large price for call options, which do really well when the stock market does really well. Now, when we increase the horizon, you see that this strong U-shape disappears. Let's have a look at the six month forward pricing kernel indicated by the, by the dashed line. This one slopes downward with only a tiny violation of monotonicity. When, when we look at the 12 month forward pricing kernel, this one slopes downward uh, monotonically. And therefore, our main result is actually that this puzzling behavior of this pricing kernel is really a short-term thing. When we look at the long-term pricing kernel uh, or look at this forward pricing kernel, this monotonicity, this violation of monotonicity disappears. The results are very similar when we look at uh, the medi median pricing kernel. All right, let's have a bit more of a look at the uh, term structure of the pricing kernel. When we look at the long-term pricing kernel, where we focus on the 10 month, 11 month, and 12 month forward pricing kernel, which is what you see in these graphs is that the shape is highly similar for these long-term, uh, longer maturities. As a second step, we will also look at a uh, time series variation of this term structure of the pricing kernel. We will start by analyzing the time series variation of the short-term pricing kernel. And in order to do so, we will define good and bad times. And we will, our definition of bad times will be the 25% quantile of the CF9, which is an economic in indicator. And we show in the paper that this definition is fairly similar to uh, NBER recessions. But CF9 has the advantage that it's actually announced. Uh, at the beginning of each month. So what we show is that this U-shape, which we found for the short-term pricing kernel, this actually increases in good times. So this U-shape becomes more pronounced during periods of good economic activity, which is both the case uh, for the mean and for the uh, median. We performed the same analysis for time series variation of the long-term pricing kernel. And the main finding here is that the time series variation of the long-term pricing kernel is very small for this long-term pricing kernel. 
All right. Then in the last part of, of our paper, we actually compare our results with the predictions of leading asset pricing models. So first we show that the low long-term pricing kernel slopes downward monotonically. And this is evidence that the pricing kernel puzzle actually disappears for longer horizons. And we show that this pricing kernel is very much in line with what uh, leading asset pricing models predict. So models by Campbell and Cochrane, Banzel Yaron, Wachter and Gabex. But this is just- Five, five minutes. Yes, thank you. Yes. But this is ter just in terms of the shape. What we also show, and I think this is a very important point, is that these models actually for their common calibrations also match the level of the long-term pricing kernel. And also in each of these models, time series variation of the pricing kernel is very small. And therefore, not only in terms of the shape is the long-term pricing kernel in line with these models, but also in terms of the level and time series variation. Then we also analyze a model which can explain the empirical features of the short-term pricing kernel. And this turns out to be a model uh, 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 which includes preferences from cumulative prospect theory, which are behavioral uh, preferences. And the success of this model in order to capture the strong U shape is probability weighting. How does probability weighting work? This theory says that invest or that aid that humans in experiment, experimental setting, these overweight the probability of rare and high impact events. So probabilities are overweighted that the stock market does really, really poorly. But at the same time, small probabilities of the fact that the stock market does really well are also at the same time overweighted. Again, we show that this model is able to match the U shape, but also this model is able to explain the time series variation in this U shape. The fact that this U shape becomes stronger during good economic activity. All right, and we think that this could be evidence. We have unfortunately no evidence of that uh, so far, but we believe that this could be evidence of maturity segmentation. So investors with more behavioral preferences, these mostly trade short-term options, whereas options with more uh, long-term options are more traded by investors with more rational preferences in line with these, uh, these asset leading asset pricing models I just mentioned. All right, so to, to, conclude, to conclude, we show the following stylized facts regarding the term structure of the pricing kernel. We show that this strong U-shape, which is documented be, uh, before in the, in the literature is a unique feature of the short-term pricing kernel. If we look at the forward long-term pricing kernel, this U-shape disappears and the pricing kernel slopes downward monotonically. Not only in terms of the level and the shape, uh, is this pricing kernel in line with models, but also we analyze the time series variation. Time series variation of the short-term pricing kernel is very large, whereas it's comparatively small for the long-term pricing kernel. Then this is what our title suggests. So the long-term pricing kernel is in line with prominent asset pricing models in terms of shape, level, and time series variation whereas the short-term pricing kernel is in line with the behavioral asset pricing model. And this is also in terms of the shape, level, and time series variation. So thank you very much for your attention. I am looking forward to the, uh, to the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, the discussion is Zhangao from SAFE. Thanks, Christian, for uh, asking me to discuss this paper. And I find it's a very easy and nice to read paper. So let me start by giving you a very quick summary of this, at least my understanding of the paper. The paper is on this classic question of this P cross times M to Q problem. And it has basically three components. It's based on a no arbitrage condition and a smart um, idea of this paper is to use option prices 
and basically the butterfly strategies prices to measure the Q measure of uh, market return directly. And then they offer a model of this um, P measure, whatever it means to you, from historical price uh, to take into account of time varying uh, volatility and skewness of curtotis and etc. So then by combining those two components, they could measure or back out the pricing kernel. So the paper is based on three uh, key settings. At first is that they assume that the state of the world in, uh, in this paper is a unidimensional state. Basically, everything is based on a return of the um, uh, market index at uh, some future horizons. Second assumption is uh, the state space is discrete and finite. And that suits actually the discrete strikes uh, of option um, contracts very well. And the third uh, important uh, assumption they make is the uh, market is complete. So the SDF, they, as they would estimate in this work, is going to be unique. Okay. The main findings of the paper is, I would have to say, based on the author's model of the P measure, if you are convinced with the accuracy of their P measure, the SDF uh, or the pricing kernel is U-shaped for the short horizon while it's not uh, so clearly U-shaped uh, or it's actually monotonically decreasing for the longer horizons. That's the key result of the paper. So my, I have about four comments and I would start with uh, a rather minor one. In, in the presentation, I think it also also mentioned that uh, they could approximate LW security by shrinking the, the delta K in the butterfly strategies when delta K goes to zero. But actually, if you think a bit more careful about it, uh, when delta K goes to zero, actually the payoff of the butterfly strategy goes to zero as well. So then the price of this strategy actually is zero. So to actually to keep the payoff uh, of the butterfly strategy unchanged, you sort of need to scale up the units of the contracts when you when you do this sort of trading right it's very similar to when you construct the digital option strategy so you, you need to scale the the unit of trading by one over delta k square i don't think this minor theoretical point is going to affect their empirical result but i i do think uh, the authors could be a bit more careful when they write the theoretical part of this paper by just um, clarifying this detail um, so the second comment is about uh, the, the settings of this paper is very similar to this um, JF paper by Steve Ross, I think it was one of her, his last publications. Uh, he has this Ross recovery theorem where uh, the settings that he assumes in, the, in that paper is very similar to these settings in, the, in this paper the authors are writing. But then uh, the, the Ross recovery theorem is a mathematical theorem that shows that with similar settings as in this paper, it seems that you don't need to model the P measure of the market returns. You could actually recover the physical distribution of market return directly from the Q measure. And you can paint it down uniquely and in a model free way. That's sort of the beauty of the Ross recovery idea. But the problem with Ross recovery theorem is that it, it ignores or it makes a very important assumption that the pricing kernel is uh, transition independent. And that was uh, criticized by several other authors later. For example, in JF, there was a paper by Hansen Schunkman and uh, their co-authors showing that uh, the Ross recovery might be misspecified because uh, this missing uh, component the permanent component of the SDF, or you call the martingale component of it as SDF, is assumed to be trivially a constant. And uh, a lot of other works shown actually the P component of SDF is rather important for asset pricing. So I, I was wondering, uh, the, the author might should the authors of this work should make it more clear that what what their assumptions actually implies. Do they actually assume the P component of the SDF is actually a trivial constant from the mathematical settings that they do? From, from, from what I see, it seems the case, but then that, that would raise these two issues. Uh, either you, you don't have to model P measure 
at all or if you assume it's trivial and uh, if you assume it's not a Markovian structure here you you back out the term structure of the SDF but then you have to be careful with the assumption of the p component that you're making I think and especially in these examples that uh, when you test with and um, these leading asset pricing models I think the p component in habit formation or long run risk models are or uh, non-trivial they're not constant and that was also shown in papering by Hansen and Schoenfeld. My third component is a bit about a um, conceptual or this methodology of using uh, any model to estimate the P uh, measure of uh, the market return. So it, it, I guess it's fair to say that the, the result of the paper about the pricing kernel's behavior is very crucially based on the, the accuracy of its modeling of the P measure of the physical measure of market return. Okay, so the, the, the better the conditional market return you give me, the more convinced I would actually be about the result the, that you're showing about the problem. But if the model is really the conditionally uh, distribution model for market return is working so well, I I actually suggest you to sell this a little bit more in your in your paper. You can do more predictability test or out of sample test to to sell that model that you construct, because that's <clears throat> that's actually something also very important in asset pricing to be able to capture this the conditional behavior of market returns. And I understand the paper tries to use a sophisticated model to capture um, the time varying volatility and also the stylized factor of the skewness and kurtosis of the returns of market. And I can imagine someone, maybe a referee, could actually challenge this by iterate this question to the nth moment, right? So then you can ask this conceptual question that do we actually because essentially what the paper is doing is try to match the moment generating function of the market return conditionally. So then the question to ask here is that, can we numerically characterize a distribution if we know everything about the moment generating function? And I'm not the first to ask this question, actually. The question was asked 30 years ago by a mathematician from University of Chicago. And he published a, a one page or half page paper to answer this question. So here the author plot uh, two distributions that has apparently very different behavior on the left hand side and uh, calculate the moment generating function on the right hand side, which you can't tell the difference because they're essentially identical empirically. So that short answer to this question is actually no. So, and numerically you can actually get very close to the moment generating function, but you may not get the right distribution and the distribution may actually behave very, uh, very weirdly to the very realistic one. Especially, I, I, I assume the result of this u shape and pricing kernel is actually um, dependent uh, a lot on the tail behavior of the physical distribution that you recover. There are two concerns there. One is the tail, I don't, I don't think in your modeling is captured very well precisely um, at, at, at infinity, both to negative and positive. Second is when you estimate your uh, state space from uh, the, for the Q measure, the strikes of the, uh, of the options that you measure, usually at the out of money side, is not very liquid. So the measurement you would have from Q measure is also not very uh, accurate. I, I think I, I, here, I guess in the literature, people might already thought about this issue. It's just in the paper when I read, I actually didn't really see uh, much clarification of all, all these concerns for me as sort of an outsider of this, uh, of this literature. My last comment is, um, is on the interpretation of potential ways to explain the U-shaped pricing kernel. So the also authors turn to uh, behavior models um, after they test some leading asset pricing models try to calibrate this u-shaped um, pricing kernel uh, well i think maybe you could actually also think about uh, heterogeneous agent model for instance you could think a model where actually everybody behaves rationally but actually they are not always the same um, for example you could think of a simple heterogeneous belief model where 
everyone has even the same risk preferences like log utility and but have with different uh, beliefs about what is going to happen in the future for the market return so for in this very simple model agents individual agents sdf is going to be monotonic on market return for each single agent but because of their different beliefs they would actually allocate differently among risky and risk-free assets. So this data I is going to capture their portfolio choice. Then uh, SDF will differ across agents, but still they can agree on the asset prices, but they just disagree on the true probability distributions. And that's, I think, a very realistic situation happening in the market, especially when people enter trades with options and stuff. So you have some extremists in the market all the time betting completely different views against the sentiment of the median market participants. So if you if you actually have that in your mind, an econometrician, in fact, cannot really observe their belief exposed from prices. So then you would have this measurement issue is very, very conceptually. So in this imaginary model, you actually can plot the, the median SDF. And in fact, this SDF is U-shaped. An example is a recent working paper by um, my courser and his um, courses that they actually work on models sort of in on this direction. That in a, a, in a heterogeneous a belief setting, you could actually have a medium SDF that looks like you know, U-shaped, which is what an econometrician would estimate exposed by observing the historical price of uh, no assets and etc. But for each individual agent, the conditional SDF is actually a monotonic one. So that's, that's I think, maybe an, an alternative explanation to this uh, be, um, behavior of SDF that, uh, that you observe. It's sort of um, and taking the view of this um, um, staying on the street, maybe that uh, in the short run, the market is a voting machine, and in the long run, uh, the market is a weighing machine. So it is actually kind of captures this um, intuition that you have that the U shape is very short lived and it would actually decay away in the long run. So I suggest you to look into this direction as well. Uh, that will be all my comments, and uh, I hope I am on time.